So uh, I'll just start off. As you may or may not know, my name is Sandra Reimer, and I work with Tour Imagination on their communication. I've been working with them for the past seven years, and if you don't know, Tour Imagination has been helping North American Anabaptists connect with their heritage through group tours in Western Europe, Russia, Ukraine, Poland, and South and Central America for more than 50 years. In fact, uh, the True Imagination 50 year anniversary is coming up in June. We are collaborating on the Anabaptist Story Lives On virtual museum and archive tour with eight Anabaptist heritage organizations across Canada and the United States. The first uh, stop on this virtual tour last week with, was with Conrad Stays in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And tonight we are privileged to stop in Abbotsford, British Columbia, and we have Richard Thiessen making the presentation. Richard is the executive director of the Mennonite Heritage Museum in Abbotsford. Previously, he was librarian at the Mennonite Brethren Bible College, Concord College, and library director at the Columbia Bible College. Richard's love for Mennonite history and de genealogy have been the focus of much of his volunteer work. He has served as president of both the Mennonite Historical Society of Canada and the Mennonite Historical Society of British Columbia, and was also active for many years with the Manitoba Mennonite Historical Society. For 20 years, he has also been involved with GAMEO, the Global Anabaptist Mennonite Encyclopedia Online. If you've never been there, it is quite an adventure. GAMEO.org, I'll put it in the chat and um, you'll find all kinds of great stuff on there for doing research. I believe our next week's presenter, John Isaac, who's also in Winnipeg, Manitoba, will be talking more about that. So we're going to begin this evening with a 20 minute presentation with Richard and his colleagues, Jenny and Jennifer. And after the presentation, you can type questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. And Richard will answer as many of them as possible. So you'll notice there's both a chat section and a Q&A section. Um, uh, you can put your comments and things you want to say, hellos, all the kind of things in the chat. And we ask that you put your questions in the Q&A so that we can make sure that we see them. Thank you. And I will now turn it over to Richard. Okay, thank you, Sandra. And uh, thank you to Audrey and to Imagination for putting this uh, this virtual museum tour together. We're pretty excited to be able to do this. And um, probably, probably like a lot of other uh, museums or historical societies, we're having to try to figure out what to do with the COVID-19 environment that we find ourselves in and how we continue to, to connect to people and continue to be able to tell our stories. So um, this has been a, a good, uh, I guess, excuse for us to begin exploring how to do this by video. And, uh, and so here we are. So I'll say just a little bit about uh, the museum and about Mennonites here in British Columbia. And then I will play for you a couple of videos uh, that we've prepared. One is a, a visual introduction to the museum. And the second one is a similar kind of an introduction to the Mennonite Historical Society of BC, which shares uh, it's the space here at the museum with us. And, um, and then we'll do a little bit of a presentation on uh, some artifacts that we have both in the museum as well as in the Historical Society vault. And then we'll open it up to questions. So um, I, I recognize that my audience here is both uh, people here in British Columbia as well as people from throughout Canada and uh, United States, possibly elsewhere as well. So um, just to give you a little bit of a brief history, Mennonites um, began coming to British Columbia uh, in the very early 20th century. Uh, most of them have been coming across from Western Canada and attempted several settlements throughout British Columbia, mostly in the interior of the province. Um, there were several that were started during World War I or right after World War I. Uh, none of those settlements really succeeded. Uh, there was one in Vanderhoof, there was one in a place called Needles, and, um, and one or two others, but they didn't really uh, succeed. The first settlement that succeeded 
was called Yero. And uh, there were two Mennonite families that came from Manitoba, settled in, um, in Yero right at the end of 1927. They told their friends about, about Yero, and uh, several months later, there were about a dozen families from uh, Western Canada that settled in this little community called Yero. And they recreated uh, uh, a Mennonite village like they would have experienced in Russia. And you know? um, come here. The, the um, settlement continued to flourish. And uh, today we have. Uh, He's uh, talking about Yarrow uh, was started in BC. 75. First settlement of Mennonites in 27. In British Columbia that would be classified as Mennonite churches today. So the Mennonite Brethren are the largest grouping here in British Columbia. And then we have Mennonite Church. And then we have a number of other smaller, smaller, smaller Mennonite groups as well. Um, but this province, unlike probably most other areas in North America, is dominated uh, very much by the Mennonite Brethren uh, presence. And so that's, uh, that gives us a bit of a unique, unique flavor. Um, so the museum uh, is an attempt to tell the story of the Mennonites who came here to British Columbia, and it follows their story from the 16th century in uh, Europe, following the route across Northern Europe to Poland, Prussia, to Russia, settling in Western Canada, and then making their way here to BC. And we've had Mennonites moving to BC beginning in the 1920s, but then we had another wave after World War II, and uh, we continue to see Mennonites relocating here to BC, um, both from other parts of Canada, as well as Mennonites from, uh, from Mexico, uh, Paraguay, and other countries in South America as well. So we, we continue to um, see the face of the Mennonite church changing with a lot of the uh, immigration that has come to the province. We have Mennonites that worship in probably 15 to 20 different languages here in the province. So it's, it's, a, very, uh, it's a very cosmopolitan, I guess, or international looking, looking church today. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my screen here and I'm going to show you two videos. The first one will be a video uh, that's been put together by uh, Jenny Bergen, who is our museum educator, and she will tell you a little bit more about our museum. So just give me a second here while I get this set up. So what I'm going to do, uh, just to kind of finish up our time here, is to talk about uh, some items that we have in our museum and in our historical society uh, vault. And we thought we'd bring them out and um, by telling the story, uh, be able to show you the kinds of, kinds of things that we collect and, um, and document here at the historical society and the museum and uh, how we can help tell the Mennonite story with these objects. So today I'm going to tell you a story about a little village just north of Warsaw. And uh, until World War II, it was called Deutsch Kazun. And it was a village that probably didn't have more than 500 people at uh, the height of its um, existence. Um, but it, uh, for, uh, for several reasons, we have uh, items, both documents as well as objects from that church that were brought to us after World War II. And so we're going to tell that story through the, by looking at these objects. And uh, so if, uh, Sandra, if you can also share Jennifer's uh, screen with the participants, then they will be able to to see what I am talking about. Um, the church started around 1834. The people who came to the village were inhabitants in Poland, in the Kulm area, and the Graudens area. They were in the Vistula Valley, so south of the Vistula Delta, where most Mennonites in what was Poland and later became Prussia had settled. So the, uh, these Mennonites had made their way south into the Vistula Valley, 
and by the early 1800s continued moving south and, and established several villages, one very close to Warsaw called Deutsch Kazoon. And um, one of the things that I want to show you here is a picture of what the church looks like today. So Sandra, I, I hopefully um, you are sharing my screen now. And uh, this is a picture of the, Deutsch, the former Deutsch Kazoon Church as it exists today, uh, just north of Warsaw. You can see that it is now a house and uh, it is inhabited um, by a Polish family. The first time I saw this house was a few years ago and uh, I was on a tour of Poland and um, it was kind of interesting. The, the bus stopped at the side of the road and our tour leader got out. And I don't know if Audrey from Tour Imagination works this way, but our tour guide had a six pack of beer with him. And he walked down this uh, narrow road and uh, disappeared. And then he came back a few minutes later and he motioned for us to, to come out of the bus and walk down this narrow road. And here basically we came upon uh, this building. So basically the tour leader had brought uh, the inhabitant a gift and asked if we could walk around his property and take a look at this church. So that was the first time I had ever visited this church. And um, so the, the church was established in the 1830s. Um, by the late 1890s, the church relocated a little further away from the Vistula River. It was a bit too close to the river and the river um, would flood in the spring. And so they basically relocated the church to uh, the other side of the bank. And um, that church stood until just after um, World War I. Uh, the church had been destroyed during the war and it was rebuilt. And so the building that exists today is a structure that was built after World War I. Um, the story is of a church that was basically caught between different, uh, different people groups, uh, different countries. Uh, if you know your history of Poland, you know that uh, there was a time when Poland was a very uh, strong country. And unfortunately, by the middle of the 18th century, the country declined in its power and strength. Um, the Pol Poland was divided three times between 1772 and 1795. By 1795, Russia, Prussia, and Austria had completely uh, uh, had taken the complete control over Poland, and Poland no longer existed from 1795 until November 11th, 1918, at the end of the war, when Poland was reborn. So the people who were living in this Mennonite village, uh, they had already gone through several transitions and uh, now they experienced another transition. So the first book that I'm going to have Jennifer show us now, Sandra, if we can share Jennifer's screen again. Uh, this is a church register that was originally created beginning in 1834. It was a list of all of the youth in the church who had been baptized. And it uh, appears that the register was re-copied uh, or copied again in, in 1902. So another copy of the register was made. So you can see the fine uh, calligraphy on the um, first page. And Jennifer, if you wanna just turn the page over and then we can see an example of the uh, baptism entries for this church. So uh, in the early years- Richard, were... I'm just gonna stop you there. Um, okay. You need to stop sharing your screen and then they'll see what Jennifer's showing. Oh, okay, okay, so there we go. Yes, that's it. Okay, so this is, uh, yeah, this is a, the title page for the register and the, um, like I said, the register appears to have been created beginning in 1834 and then um, was copied in 1902. And it's just an, an example of the beautiful writing 
uh, the calligraphy of, of the, uh, the minister in the church or the secretary in the church. And you can see the, uh, the names of these people. And like I, like I said, a lot of these people were originally inhabitants of, uh, in the Kum area, uh, today Chomno, and uh, had relocated further south towards Warsaw in the 1830s. So um, after World War I, the church had to go through another transition. Uh, as I said, Poland was reborn, and the church now had to make a transition to the Polish language. So Jennifer is now going to show us an example of another register from the church in Deutsch Kazun. And this is an example of a register that was written after World War I, and you can see that it's all written in Polish. So um, it's just interesting to think of a church that has to make that language transition. Now, we know that already in the 1930s, there was uh, the, 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 the National Socialist Movement was making headway in Germany, and that was obviously having an impact on the German-speaking people in Poland as well. And unfortunately, um, the Mennonites uh, were caught up uh, in, that, um, in that sentiment as well, creating some hard feelings with the, the local Poles. Um, what I'm going to have Jennifer do now is move over to another register. And um, it's fascinating. If, if you've ever been to the Weierhof, which is the Mennonite Library uh, and Archive in Weierhof, Germany, they have the church register from Danzig that was rescued from the bombed out church at the end of World War II. And you can see the edges of the register have been burnt. While we have a register that was hit by a shell, and we are guessing that this happened in September 1939 when Germany attacked Poland. Um, Deutsche Kuzun sustained uh, severe damage. There were uh, about a half a dozen homes that were destroyed, that were inhabited by Mennonites. And there were seven Mennonites that were killed in that air raid. This obviously created very hard feelings uh, between the Mennonites and the Poles. And at that time, uh, the Polish army uh, came to Deutsch Kazun. They arrested the Altester, Rudolf Bartel, and seven other men from the church, and they were executed. Uh, so in this period of, of uh, just several weeks, uh, you had these two tragedies, first this air raid, and then the execution of um, eight in total. So this page here is from the uh, 1939 register, which shows you uh, the names of those people who died in that month. And um, so these were the people who were both killed in the air raid, as well as those men who were rounded up by the Polish army and executed. All other men, ages 16 to 60, were arrested and incarcerated. Uh, of course, this was not for very long because within a matter of days, Germany had uh, completed their invasion of Poland and they released these uh, men and they were able to return home. But you now had a church that was being ruled as part of the Third Reich. And so Jennifer is going to show us now a document that is just an example of the kinds of documents that the church had to create they were documents basically um, certifying uh, a birth or a marriage or a death. And as she zooms in here, you can see a stamp with the uh, swastika on it. So it's an example of uh, a, a church that has now had to go through another transition and is now um, living in territory ruled by the Third Reich. So the story of the church came to a very dramatic end in 1945. And I wanted to tell that story by talking about the last minister of the church. And his name was Leo Ewert, Leo Ebert. And um, he was born in Deutsch Kazun in the end of the 19th century, uh, became a teacher and actually moved to the Molochna Mennonite settlement in South Russia and took on a teaching position there. And in fact, he got married to a local, local uh, young woman from Muntau. 
And then um, he chose to move back to Deutsch Kazoon after uh, a year or two. His father required him to come and work on the farm. And so the uh, Leo was elected to the ministry. And after several years of hesitancy on his part, uh, finally took on um, that position. And after September 1939, when the Altester, Rudolf Bartel, was executed, Leo became the elder or the Altester of the church. In 1945, sorry, 1943, his wife and children already had fled to the West, but Leo had to stay behind because of his work. And he too then fled in 1945. And before he fled, he rounded up all sorts of church registers, the ones that we have just shown you now, bundled them all together. And he also took with him the uh, communion table cover and the communion cups and plate. Now, Jennifer, I'm not sure if you're able to video, uh, turn your video on for that. And if Sandra, if you can show Jennifer's uh, video again. This is an example of the tablecloth for the communion table that uh, Leo Ewert took with him when he left the church in 1945. And then Jennifer is also going to show us the communion cups the goblets, and also the plate. And it's interesting to think of a person who is in that position. <clears throat> it's, it's kind of like they're the last man standing um, in the church. They know that the church is going to be overrun uh, this time by the Soviet army. And he's basically wanting to preserve the story of the church. So he takes the church registers and he takes these communion artifacts with him and brings them with him throughout uh, his time in Germany, where he, work, where he works uh, as a minister for a few years, and then when he comes to Canada and settles here in the Fraser Valley. So it's because of Leo that we have these items from the, his church, and we have all of these church registers. And uh, it's a fascinating story of someone who had the foresight to, um, to grab the items that were available to him and preserve the story of that church. It's hard to imagine being in that position and thinking, now, what would we do if we had to leave our home? Would we take anything from the church? And if so, what would we take? I just find it fascinating that he chose to take the communion cups and the plate and the tablecloth that uh, for him, I think um, just reminded him of the community that he had and that had existed in Deutsch Kazoon for over 100 years. So that's basically the end of my formal presentation. Uh, if you come to the museum, you will see these items. You'll see a lot of other items that we have as well on display. And um, as you can see from our, as you saw from our videos, what we want to do is we want to tell the story. We want to tell the story of those people who came and settled here in the Fraser Valley in British Columbia and how they got here and how they were able to bring the Mennonite faith um, to this part of North America. So uh, thanks for your time. And again, sorry that the, uh, that the videos didn't turn out properly, but we will share those um, on our YouTube channel and we'll make sure that you guys have links to those so you can watch them uh, uh, at, your, at your convenience. So, sure. San so Sandra, um, Jennifer will be here as well. So if people have questions uh, for, for Jennifer, she, she's uh, willing to answer those questions as well. <laughs> Terrific. I see our first uh, question has come in from Dora, and she's wondering, were those communion items used in any other church later? I am not aware that they were ever used in any other church. Uh, I can't say with certainty. Um, the children um, of, of Leo have also passed on, uh, so I won't be able to ask. But from what I understand, they, they were not used in any other church. Okay. Now, Berna is asking, is there an online list of historical items that you have at the museum? And do you have any items people can actually access online? Uh, we have, uh, we do not have a list of the items that we have at our museum. Um, but on our website, we actually have several videos. Uh, they're about four to five minutes each. And I'm 
I, I would really uh, recommend that you watch those videos. Basically what we did is about five years ago when we built the museum, we decided to interview a dozen people and have them tell their stories. Uh, and they represented a wide variety of people. Some were people who had grown up um, in, uh, in Russia and the Soviet Union and had immigrated to Canada in the 1920s. Others were people who were refugees during World War II and uh, had fled their homes and made their way to the West and come to Canada after World War II. Uh, some were people who had grown up here in the Fraser Valley. Others uh, grew up elsewhere. Um, we even have a, a woman who, who grew up in Harbin, China. If you know the story of the Mennonites who, who crossed the Amur River and uh, she was born in China and then their family came, um, came to, to Paraguay and then up to Canada after that. So we, we tried to cover a number of different stories in those videos. And we have several of those videos on our website. So yeah, those, those are, are um, uh, available for people to watch. That's terrific. I can uh, put a link to some of those things in the follow-up email so people can access them easily. Okay. We have um, a question from Tina about the museum. Was it a former home or was it built for the purpose? And when you talk about that, maybe you can say a little bit more about the founder. The video was shaky on that. So if okay. you could just repeat a little about that, that would be helpful. Okay. The museum was built um, beginning in September 2014. So it was built uh, from scratch. Um, so we completed uh, in the fall of 2015 and opened in January 2016. Uh, the developer that is the visionary behind this museum is Peter Redekop. Uh Peter Redekop is still alive and lives in Richmond, British Columbia, close to Vancouver. Uh, his family f grew up in uh, Niederkortitsa in the old colony in Russia. They fled in 1943, and they made their way all the way to the Netherlands and showed up at the border and uh, basically claimed that they were Dutch and they were returning home after about 500 years. And uh, the authorities didn't know what to do with them, but uh, I think there were 33 of them, uh, 33 of them, and the... Uh, so the, um, some university uh, academics came to interview these people and they heard them speak in their uh, low German and their Plautdeutsch and said, yep, yeah, they're Dutch, let's let them in. So, um, so that's, the, that's uh, a very interesting uh, part of their story. Uh, eventually, Peter Dick, who many of you know, uh, worked with MCC for many years, Peter Dick came across this group in the Netherlands and um, told them that he will find a way for them to come to Canada. So the Redekops came right at the end of 1947, settled in Manitoba, lasted about six months and made their way to British Columbia, settling in Abbotsford. And um, so Peter and his brothers all became developers and they've supported a number of different Mennonite organizations. And Peter just had a vision to build a museum here in Abbotsford that would tell the Mennonite story. So that's, uh, that's how we came to be. That's great. Now there's a question from Jim. Do the archives contain documents from the Mennonite churches that existed in what's now Lithuania and formerly East Prussia? Do you have we any don't, you no, know, we do, we do not have any records from the, that part of, of Europe. Okay. Uh, we have, we have some of these registers from Poland. We have, um, uh, some, uh, other records from, from Russia. We don't have any Russian church registers, but we do have uh, some, fo some um, digital copies of some registers that were also brought here to British Columbia. So we have the digital, a digital copy of the Scheinhorst church register, which was brought by another minister uh, hmm. after World War II. Um, we don't have the actual register, but we have, like I said, we have digital copies of it. And that register is here somewhere in British Columbia as well. So okay. there were a few of these registers that were rescued, you know, after World War II. But we, of, of all of those registers, we just have the ones from the Deutsche Kazoon. Okay. Um, and there's a question specifically about that story. Um, were, who were Rudolf Bartel and the other men executed by? They were executed by the Polish army. Okay. Yeah, so um, right at the beginning of, of September 1939, 
uh, after the German attack, there was a lot of, um, I guess, a lot of anger that was directed towards the, the Mennonites who were seen as Germans. And uh, basically, it was re retribution against, uh, against, unfortunately, against these Mennonites. Right. And, uh, I guess it got caught up in this all. Yeah. And there's a question about the, I'm going to get the pronunciation wrong, but Hubiden Mennonite Church in Poland or Prussia? Mm hmm. Do you have any of those registers or other information uh, in your archives? We have digital scans of a number of the church registers from what was Prussia that would include, that would include Hoibuden. Um, those registers, and, and there are other archives here in North America that would also have scans of those registers. So they've been shared um, by say Bethel College, that uh, Bethel College, uh, the Mennonite Library and Archives of Bethel College, uh, microfilmed uh, a number of the registers before they were sent back to to the Weyerhof. And um, there are other registers as well that we have come across since. And so there are digital copies of those registers here at our archives. Okay. That sounds good. Uh, okay, Dawn is wondering, with the gradual reopening of businesses, institutions in BC, will the museum, museum be open to visitors as well? Do you have a, a plan for when that might happen? No, that's a good, that's a, it's, a, it's a good question and it's a hard question for us to answer. Uh, we have between our two societies about 100 volunteers. The vast majority of those volunteers are retired people. Uh, so people in their 60s, 70s, and even 80s. And um, from what we understand of COVID-19, the, uh, the group that is most vulnerable are those who are seniors in our, in our midst. And so I'm, I'm very hesitant to rush to open our doors again and bring our, bring our volunteers back. And uh, the other factor is that most of our visitors are also seniors. And so um, we are needing to come up with a way that we can do that safely. And um, we're, still, we're still working on that. We're, we're having to follow guidelines from, from our provincial government. And uh, this today now is just the first day that our province has opened up to, I guess, what they're calling the second level of, yeah. of um, interaction that, that people are having. So organizations like ours are are kind of scrambling to try to figure out what, you know, what, if anything, can we do to, to bring people back through our, through our doors again. Right. Um, but our, our primary concern is the health and the safety of our volunteers. And so that's something that we have to really consider um, before we do something like that again. That makes sense. Yeah. We but, we are, but what we are doing is we have a lot of people who come to our coffee shop and oh. they enjoy um, some uh, traditional Mennonite uh, items like Pershki and Plots. And so you can actually order uh, your own um, uh, serving of, of, of uh, plots and perski and cinnamon buns and things like that and come by and, and pick them up. We have a bit of a drive-through uh, nice. service that we've started now. So this is just the second week that we're doing that. So if you're oh. really missing that connection with the, with the museum, you can at least <laughs> in, enjoy uh, an edible version of it. <laughs> That's nice. That's great. We have a question from Hank. From where did Mennonites migrate to Poland, Prussia, mostly from Friesland? And what about southern Germany or other areas? So from what we understand, um, most of the Mennonites who settled in uh, what was then Poland um, in the beginning already in the 1530s and then later uh, Prussia, most of those people came from, from the Netherlands. Now, whether they were from Friesland or from further south in what is now Belgium, is, it's not quite clear um, what, the, what the ethnic breakdown would be. Uh, there were also people who were coming into Poland from northern Germany, what is now northern Germany, and there were also people coming in from uh, southern Germany, from uh, even what today is Czech Republic or Slovakia, from some of those areas as well. But most of the Mennonites who came to Poland in the 16th century had uh, primarily a Dutch background. Okay. So Frisian, Frisian as well as Flemish. Okay, that's good with a, little, with a little bit of German, German thrown in, yeah. <laughs> And uh, we have a question about the um, story of the church in Poland. Uh, for the Mennonite, Bill is asking, for the Mennonite men between the ages of 16 and 60, do you know if the intent of the Poles was to prevent these men from joining the 
Wehrmacht and other forces? Well, that that would be a good guess. You know, I I can't say, but that you know, no, knowing the way the way things worked during World War II, yeah, countries tried to protect um, that that thing from happening, and the same thing happened in in Ukraine as well in 1941 when the German army uh, was 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 quickly approaching the Russian. Uh, government and officials tried to round up as many of the people, including especially the men, as possible to make sure that they, you know, wouldn't now be able to serve in the in the occupying army. Um, right. So that's a it's a good guess, but I I can't say definitively if that was the if that was the rationale. Okay, and um, speaking of the people who arrived in Poland, what about the Swiss Volians? Volians? The Valinians. Valinians. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's a group of of people that um, came pre- yeah, primarily from uh, of a Swiss background, South German background, and settled in Volinia, which at some point in time was part of Poland and eventually became part of Russia and is more part of the western Western Ukraine region as well. So that is yeah, that is a group um, that was of, of a bit of a different ethnic background. Um, than the majority that settled in the Vista La Delta and and then further south in the valley. Yeah. Okay, that's good. We we don't ha- we don't have uh, we don't have uh, as a rule we don't have people of that background who settled here in British Columbia. Yeah. I think most oh. of them settled and settled in uh, the Dakotas and uh, right in uh, the Midwest. Yeah. So that's something, uh, Marnette Hofer with um who's in south dakota maybe she can talk to us more about that That's when right. her presentation comes yeah but i should say i'm seeing one of the questions here um we do have a number of people who settled here in the firza valley after world war ii who were from deutsch Gazun and deutsch Vimischl and some of these other villages that are just you know fairly close to to warsaw in that vicinity so there are a number um uh, and and so people with the names like Ratzleff, you know, that, that's a that's a very common common name from from that area. Um, yeah, we have a number of families that that came from that from those areas and settled here in the Fraser Valley again mm-hmm. after World War II. Yeah, we I think we will close things down shortly. Um, we have a couple of questions specifically about your museum. Okay. Um, about do you work with school children? And the other one, related one is, do you have many non-Mennonites and how is the Mennonite story received by non-Mennonites who might visit? Yeah. We do have a number of school groups that come, uh, both private school as well as public school classes. And uh, Jenny Bergen, who you would have seen a little bit of in the video, um, she is our museum educator. So she works with our school groups. to help support them in their in their curriculum, and uh, like I said, we have uh, classes from both private schools, Mennonite, and other private schools, as well as public schools. So it's a lot of fun to have to have the students come in and uh, do the tours of the museum. Um, I don't really know what the breakdown would be in terms of uh, visitors who have a Mennonite background and and those who don't. Um, but we do get a number of visitors. Um, both from Canada as well as from other countries who really don't have a Mennonite background, um, might not know very much about Mennonites, but it's one of the, it's one of the things that, that is recommended that they do when they come to Abbotsford. Um, we're, we're quite a popular tourist destination. And so, uh, yeah, we do get a lot of visitors and have a lot of good uh, uh, interaction with them as they're, for some of them, as they learn about the Mennonite story for the first time. That's great. Yeah. Um, and I'm putting you on the spot a little bit with this one. We didn't rehearse this ahead of time, but I hear that you and Gareth Brandt are leading an epic heritage tour coming up. Do you want to say a little bit about that? What the? Well, sure. <laughs> yeah, a, shame, a shameless plug, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So Gareth Brandt is an instructor at Columbia Bible College, where I used to be the library director. And uh, so he and I are good friends, and we've been talking for a, a long time already about doing a tour. Um, and so Tour Imagination has graciously uh, accepted our proposal to do a tour. We're calling it the Epic Anabaptist Tour. So basically, we are going to start in Switzerland, in Zurich, and we're going to make our way all the way through, uh, through southern Germany and, and Strasbourg and France and up to the, um, to the Munster area in Germany, across to Amsterdam, up to Friesland, over to Poland, and down to Ukraine. 
and do that all in three weeks. So it'll be a bit of a whirlwind tour and you'll get, uh, you'll get 500 years of the Anabaptist story. That's why we're calling it the Epic Anabaptist Tour. So if you are interested, definitely take a look at the True Imagination website for more details in terms of the dates. And uh, yeah, this, of course, is assuming that we're going to be able to travel next year. But uh, I really hope that we can do this. I think it'd be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And so you can basically do uh, one, two, or three um, sections. It's, it's up to you. You can choose the first, the middle, or the end, or whatever you want. A lot of flexibility. Nice. Sounds like a good time. Two tour leaders for the price of one. And uh, <laughs> a lot of stamps in your passport. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's terrific. Uh, let me see if we have any final questions and then we'll close it up. Uh, one last question. The, one, the people who came from southern and northern Germany to Poland in the 1500s, were they already called Mennonites? Well, not quite sure, um, you know, when the name Mennonite would have been uh, ascribed to those people. Um, probably Anabaptist would have been a more general term mm -hmm. for those people. Or in some cases, they would not have referred to them by their religious affiliation. They would have re referred to them as Dutch or as Hollanders. Um, even when you go to Poland today, um, they talk about the, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it, but Allendry, I think, is basically the Polish word for, the, for Dutch. Um, Hollanders uh, or... Um, yeah, are, are people of Dutch extraction. So a lot of the Mennonites, when they first settled in Poland, were just basically seen as Dutch people. And they were invited to come to Poland because they knew that these people were well-equipped to help them with drainage, the drainage of, of land and the creation of farmland. So um, they knew that they were of a different religious uh, affiliation, but Poland was a very um, uh, open-minded country, unlike most other countries in Europe. They didn't, uh, they didn't have harsh, harsh persecution against uh, religious minorities, whether they were Mennonites or Jews or other groups. So they were fairly tolerant. So as long as they were providing a service to the country and helping to um, create farmland and restore land that had been farmland in the past, um, they were welcome to settle in, in, the, in the area and be tolerated. They didn't have the same religious freedoms uh, they couldn't build their own churches, so they had to meet in homes for a number of, of years um, and things like that. But uh, they were tolerated. And so, I, again, I'm not sure when they would have been called Mennonites, but um, as far as the Poles were concerned, these, these were Dutch people. And they called them Dutch. Great. Well, thank you very much. This has been a very informative evening. We really appreciate it. We're getting lots of thank yous in the chat. So, um, Appreciate it, and uh, we'll send out links to the videos in the follow-up email you will all receive, plus a link to this recording. And um, we hope you can join us for week three with John Isaac from the Center for Mennonite Brethren Studies. And thanks again. Okay, thank you, everyone. All right, good night, Richard. Good night.